Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm really excited and thrilled today uh, because Mr. Montek Singh Aluwalia is here to give a talk. Uh, he's an Indian economist and a civil servant. And uh, I always like to say that he's one of my favorite economists because as a young girl, eight, nine, ten years old, he and his colleagues made it possible for me to get more than two kinds of chocolate and <laughs> drink Pepsi and get Michael Jackson CDs and all other things that were not possible uh, before some of the you know reforms that were introduced. Uh, so I did have a favorite economist growing up, and he was one of them. Um, um, over three decades, uh, you know, Montek has held various positions in the government of India, including the deputy chairman of the planning commission. He was literally, you know, the last of the transition economists pulling India out of socialism uh, into a more, you know, market friendly welfare state during his time there. He's been part of the economic advisory council to the prime minister as finance secretary, commerce secretary, special secretary to prime minister and so on. And if I go on, we'll spend the whole lunch hour you know, sort of reading his resume. Um, one of the things that I would like to highlight, though, is he's the author of something that we now call the M document. Uh, he wrote a memo in the late 80s, which turned into what became the blueprint for the first set of reforms uh, that happened in India. He's talked about this a little bit in his book. Uh, it's called Backstage. It's uh, sort of a travelogue for those of us in policy, you know, talking about how uh, a career in policy can take big ideas and convert them into implementable, executable reforms. And this is, of course, particular to India. He's also written, you know, dozens of papers, book chapters, and so on. Uh, some of this is listed on the 1991 website at Mercatus. So, you know, you should be able to find it quite easily. And um, he's always been a champion of economic growth, uh, fiscal discipline, free trade, uh, things that I thought were only pertinent to India. But last night over dinner, I realized some of these themes are now becoming very important even in the United States, right? We, we need some of the champions for these themes, and many of you are working on them. Uh, so today, he's going to talk about India's growth story, sort of what happened in the past, and also some of the challenges uh, that, that India is facing today and in the future. So I'll stop there. Montek, thank you for being here. Well, thank you, Shruti, for those very kind words. And uh, thank you and your colleagues at uh, the MacArthur Center for inviting me. I think the work you're doing is enormously important. Uh, when I first heard about uh, the idea of a 1991 project, which would not only collect a lot of people's opinions and podcasts and interviews and articles and so on, and become a sort of definitive um, source to for anyone wanting to study this transition you know it struck me that the the technique used is actually very innovative i mean in the sense that i can imagine somebody collecting all the published articles and i don't think that would be good enough uh, the main reason is that uh, i mean i'm kind of trained as an economist uh, and i my training technically stopped in 1968 so frankly, I'm, I mean, if there is such a thing as being outdated, I would be it, other than sort of having seen younger people uh, coming and assisting me and realizing that the, uh, the subject has moved on. But, you know, in a way, I think what uh, was more true in those days, uh, that uh, people viewed uh, economics as more of a narrative than they do today. Uh, I mean, there are distinguished, exceptions, particularly in American tradition, I think, that probably owes to Paul Samuelson, that you know, we reduce everything to what is quantifiable and mathematical, and that has huge advantages in many ways. But you know, the loss of the narrative content is also a huge loss because we're really talking about societies changing. Uh, and the idea, I mean, uh, anybody who's an academic is gonna make his reputation by applying an innovative technique to studying something. And that is invariably going to reduce uh, the study to whatever there it is for which both the theory and the data are available. And where the theory is not available, of course, is very difficult, but many times there's a kind of a rudimentary theory, but no data at all. And those are not subjects that anyone studies. So I think it's very important if you're looking at it as a transformation uh, that you go beyond what is actually publishable. And that's why I find the, uh, 
the idea of the 1991 project extremely well conceived. So congratulations, Shruti, and all the people behind and above you who must have uh, got this thing going. Great idea. You know, when I thought about, uh, about this, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Kurosawa's film Rashomon. Those who've seen it, raise their hands. That's not bad, actually. But, uh, you know, in, in my days in university, 90% of the hands would go up. Actually, I'm sure it's available now on YouTube. I'd strongly advise any young person who hasn't seen it to actually see it. Because I found it an incredibly powerful demonstration of how four different people, looking at the same facts, came up with completely different explanations of what was going on. And, you know, while, I mean, it's, it's only a one and one hour quarter or something film, but anyone who's doing empirical analysis would do well to just watch the film. And at the end of whatever they're doing, ask themselves, what would Kurosawa say of my analysis? And I think that'd be very helpful. That's why what I want to do here is to sketch out what happened more in the form of a narrative and also indicate uh, where, you know, there are different explanations. Uh, and I'll spend, I'm watching going by the clock, only about seven minutes to give you a summary thing. And then we'll look at, uh, uh, focus, focus on, you know, in the light of what we've seen in India, uh, what does India do now? And sort of maybe therefore half the talk will be on the narrative and where we are now. And the other half will be on what do we do? So on the narrative, you know, I left uh, the university in 1968, uh, uh, the University of Oxford and joined uh, the World Bank. You know, at that time, I mean, India was not actually regarded as a failure. I mean, India was regarded as a you know, promising country, lots of positive things, democracy, this, that, and the other, but not necessarily doing everything right. Uh, subsequently, in the United States, particularly, uh, the blame for the socialist tilt has been placed on Jawaharlal Nehru, our first prime minister. There's no doubt that he had that socialist inclination, but he's also a practical guy. And I think at that time, the notion that a poor country that wants to get ahead fast must resort to some kind of state intervention and state planning in order to grow more rapidly was pretty widely accepted. Uh, in the United States, I think I mentioned in my book, none other than Paul Samuelson in his famous textbook, uh, as early as the, I think the early 1980s, uh, would say things like, uh, the Soviet Union is growing very rapidly, and at this rate, they'll overtake the United States in whatever, 1986, and then two editions later, he would make it a little bit later. So what I mean is if Samuelson got these things wrong, uh, you can be forgiven that, you know, you have whatever view you have. And I think this is, this il illustrates in a way the difficulty in making projections about the future. Um, you know, I think it was Yogi Berra who is report, he's reported to have said so many things that all the clever ones people remember. But the best one I like is the one he says, it is very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, <laughs> and this is a good example of that. Now in India, you know, my good friend, uh, Venu Reddy, who became governor and was a part of our reform team. And I think you'll see his picture in that slide somewhere. He once made this wonderful comment. He said, the future is always uncertain, but in India, even the past is uncertain. <laughs> and this is the result of, people looking at data again and saying, you know, the methodology was wrong, we must do it differently, et cetera, et cetera. So th th therefore it's very important while there are these analytical pieces, it's very important to keep in mind what's the broad narrative that you have. And my broad narrative is that what Nehru was doing was not unreasonable at all, partly because, I mean, the, I mean, the, the success of the Soviet Union as a production machine was not doubted. I mean, remember, he died in 1964. So it was not doubted at that time. Uh, what was doubted, and he doubted it hugely, was what they were doing to human liberty. And he did his bit for democracy, and you know, he didn't fall into any of that kind of uh, the communist trap, if you like, that uh, 
<laughs> we'll, we'll deny you democracy, but we'll give you development. So I think on the whole, he wasn't too bad. Where I think where things went wrong, where from the late 60s through the 1970s, and that's the Indira Gandhi period, okay? Now, she also did some good things, but the, if you like, the liberal economics, the pro-market type of fellows, I guess that includes me, they tend to hold it against her that she tightened the uh, restrictive controls of the state much more than her father had done. And she was much more anti-private sector than her father ever was. And it is in that period that India's growth performance really worsened compared to uh, other countries. In the late 50s, early 60s, India's growth was not worse than other developing countries. And it was better than it was under colonialism, which is usually the comparison you make, okay? So during this, the 1970s, it was quite clear that we were doing worse. And so I attribute that, and I say that in the book, to bad economic policy, et cetera, et cetera. And I think it was bad economic policy. But I have to say that there is the other narrative. The other narrative is those were periods where India went through quite exceptional external constraints. I mean, you had two oil shocks, 73, 79. You had the Bangladesh Liberation War, which did impose a cost on us since we sort of helped them in various ways. It alienated the United States big time from India uh, because the U.S. sent the USS Enterprise up the Bay of Bengal, which irritated a lot of people. It pushed India more into the Soviet camp simply because they didn't do anything. I mean, they didn't actually uh, invade or engage the Indian forces or whatever. But it made, made the security establishment feel that you can't, you can't rely on the United States, given that we felt the biggest problem was Pakistan. And at that time, it was very clear that Pakistan was doing pretty awful things in Bangladesh. And we were trying to help Bangladesh get liberated. Pakistan would, of course, quite legitimately call it totally unreasonable interference in our internal affairs. That's a separate matter. But that narrative uh, uh, gets further complicated because, but I think I mentioned the 1973 oil shock, the 1979 oil shock. So the defenders of the old system will say that, well, you can't say that India did badly because the external circumstance. I think if somebody were to do a proper analysis, uh, they would find that while that may explain some of the poor performance, it doesn't actually explain, uh, if you like, the departure from what I would have called India's potential. Okay, now that's worthwhile PhD for somebody to do. Um, the narrative then changes slightly in the 1980s. Mrs. Gandhi, after having imposed the emergency on India, and by the way, in the emergency, one of the things the emergency did uh, under the leadership, if you like, of her younger son was to impose a rather uh, intrusive family planning program with compulsory, near compulsory sterilization, et cetera, males and vasectomies and what have you, which interestingly, the middle class loved it. I mean, it's the poor who hated it uh, because the middle class was in any case engaging in various kinds of uh, population control methods. And this thing was really applied to the larger uh, uh, group outside the elite. And the middle class always been frightened of the growth of population, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but anyway, whatever it is, Mrs. Gandhi gets thrown out after the emergency. In comes her opponents, and that has to be one of the most catastrophic historical failures, because instead of setting right the economic policy, Mr. Desai's government dedicated itself just to putting her in jail. One of the stupidest political decisions you can think of, and they completely wasted the three years that they had, I and mean, they did absolutely nothing on the economic front, okay? And then, of course, there was an election. Things weren't going too well for the country. Mrs. Gandhi comes back. In the 1980s, Mrs. Gandhi begins a sort of incremental reform. I won't go into it too much. It's not wholehearted. You know, it's not like saying, get rid of these controls. It's like these controls are too tight, let's loosen them, but retain all the controls in place. And as it happens, the economic performance is also a little better. Now, the contra narrative is that the world economy was doing quite well in the 80s. So whether it was better because of this incrementalism or that is a subject for another PhD thesis. But 
by the end of the 80s, we ran into a classic balance of payments crisis. Kind of the sort of thing is not exactly like what's happening in Africa. Because I think what's happening in Africa is over many years of very loose monetary policy, countries could cheerfully borrow all sorts of things and they have now incurred a huge amount of debt. We didn't incur a huge amount of debt, but given the degree of openness, we did do, we did find that exports were not doing well in the late 80s, current account balance was widening, and we were financing it by running down reserves and by doing short-term borrowing. And this kind of thing is not sustainable. Uh, and uh, the, if you like, the cookie finally crumbled in 1990 when Saddam Hussein invaded Iraq. You had a huge increase in the oil price. Uh, and of course, you know, the government was very unstable uh, for a variety of reasons that I won't go into now. And to, it was very clear that this is not a government that can take corrective measures, which is, by the way, the situation in Africa, because they're all weak governments and nobody believes that they can take the tough measures needed to get the economy back on track. And I think in India, we had been discussing the, what's wrong with policy. I mean, Shruti was very kind to mention my uh, note, which is talked about in the book. But I think it's not just my, my note was an input. And the interesting thing about it is that it was produced in response to a request by the Prime Minister VP Singh. Uh, we had both gone, and he had gone as a head of the Indian delegation to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in uh, Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, he had said to me, I was part of his team, he said, you know, Kuala Lumpur looks pretty prosperous. And he said, I was here as Deputy Commerce Minister in 1973. And at that time, they looked pretty backward to me. And I said, you know, that's absolutely right, because I visited in the early 70s for the World Bank, and it was distinctly more backward than, say, Delhi. Anybody flying into Kuala Lumpur would have felt that, you know, you're a provincial city compared to Delhi and Bombay, and it's transformed. So he said, how do they do it? And I said, it's very simple. They're doing a lot of reforms, and we're not. So he said, well, why don't you do me a note? What is it that you think we should do? That's how that note got produced. Now, the interesting thing is not that the note got produced. If he had asked any halfway intelligent economist, he would have probably done the same thing. But he decided to send that to the committee of secretaries that is presided over by the cabinet secretary with the directive from the prime minister that this should be discussed. He didn't say, by the way, this is what we should do. He said, this is a note which says some interesting, please discuss it. But you know, obviously when the prime minister sends such a note, people guess that he thinks there must be something worthwhile. I mean, if it was complete rubbish, he wouldn't send it. And that created a lot of uh, discussion because people thought that the prime minister's mind is open. So a huge number of discussions. I was very pleased to find that the number of people who supported what I was saying definitely exceeded the ones that didn't. So if you took that as an indicator of what Indian thinking was, uh, the thinking clearly was in favor of change. Uh, well, when the new government came in, uh, Mr. Narasimha Rao appointed Manmohan Singh, a very well-known technocrat, and basically said, look, uh, we've got to do things differently. Now, I knew them both, and I know that Narasimha Rao was, he was not at all wedded to the old Congress control mentality. Uh, he knew that we needed to change, but I don't think he knew how to do that change. Because, you know, when everything is screwed up, uh, the way you make a change, I think, is not that you make a list of 200 things that have to change and say, now do, do this all, which is what the IMF did in 1997 in Indonesia. You say it's all mucked up. Actually, if you're a developing country, it is all mucked. That's what being a developing country means, that you're just, everything is wrong, right? Uh, or it's not where it should be. So the skill really lies, I think, in identifying the four or five critical things which are the logical first step in reform, and they should be chosen so that they are mutually supported. I mean, you could choose four or five important things, but don't do the things that are supportive of that. And I think what we did was we picked the industrial controls and trade policy and the exchange rate and opening up to FDI as an integrated set. Uh, 
and basically within two years uh, rewrote uh, the landscape on those things. Uh, very controversial. Many people said you're opening up the country. This is going back. The East India Company will be back. You're sacrificing uh, sovereignty. You are subject to the IMF's dictates, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we were able to say that, look, it's true the IMF loved what we were doing. Actually, we did more than what the IMF wanted. But what we were saying is, look, this is the result of internal thinking. There's the end document, there's a something else, et cetera. But of course, the critics said that, you know, that doesn't mean anything because these fellows are all under the influence of the IMF. So that's why they wrote these papers. Now, you can go into that. It becomes impossible to, uh, to come to a conclusion. But at that time, I think we chose a set of reforms which together made a lot of sense. I'll just give one example. You know, everybody in Indian industry wanted to get rid of investment controls, okay? I mean, they said, what the hell? I mean, if I want to expand, I want to expand. And I'm the businessman and I know what I can do. And they were right. But whereas they wanted to wanted investment licensing to go, they wanted to be able to import the machinery, et cetera, they would need to set up the cap capacity they needed. Okay, And they then expected that imports would become freely available to, as it were, to realize their investment dreams. But that would make you run into a balance of payments constraint because the exports are not doing well and the imports there's excess demand because you've liberalized investment. So what do you do? So our solution was free the exchange rate. I mean, that will automatically cause the rupee to depreciate. But many of the guys who were quite willing to import stuff at a certain exchange rate would not find it attractive if the exchange rate depreciated and they would automatically sort of walk out of the uh, the uh, line. See, otherwise what would happen is people who were queuing up in the Ministry of Industry to get licenses would just queue up in the Ministry of Commerce to get licenses. Yeah. Because the Commerce Ministry would say, we can't give that many licenses because we can't import that much. By getting rid of that control, that thing essentially, uh, the excess demand was pushed onto the exchange rate in the market. Now, there are lots of things we didn't do. I mean, we, we should have done, you know, build institutions. All of that happened in the next 20, 30 years or so, and some of it has still to happen. We were hugely criticized, hugely, uh, for not starting with agricultural reforms, okay? Now, I felt that this was quite wrong because the biggest reform that we did, which was pro-agriculture, was freeing the exchange rate because an over-appreciated exchange rate really meant that imports from outside, agricultural imports, were greatly undervalued and therefore looked like a good deal. Whereas once the exchange rate was liberalized, automatically agricultural imports became less compelling uh, and therefore it didn't really hurt Indian agriculture that much. A lot of people also say that we should have done a lot more to build more agricultural research. And I think we should have, and that's a pity, but you know, you can't get everything right. Uh, in this area that we did act, uh, it looks like a wonderful thing, but even there, there were pressures. The pressures really were vested interests do not want change. And it's interesting that we had two kinds of vested interests that we had to cater to. One is we liberalized investment for the larger industry, which is good. If they want to invest, they could bring their own money and put in investment. But there were, there were many sectors which were reserved for the small scale sector. This is in the belief that the small scale sector is inherently more labor intensive. Actually, this was wrong because what is correct is that it's easier to survive as a small industry in a sector that's labor intensive. It's impossible to exist as a small industry in a sector that's capital intensive. So we had a lot of small scale industry that was labor intensive. But that didn't mean that that was the best way of employing labor in that sector. We should have actually allowed the better ones of this lot to expand, modernize, become more competitive, and cash in on the export potential, which is what the Chinese did. We took the existing small-scale industry's unwillingness to be subjected to competition by larger units or even competition from their own brethren who might become large. 
you know, we could have had a policy that said no new investment in this sector, but any any firm in this sector that wants to expand for the next 10 years is freely allowed to do so, and then we'll allow others to come in. Even that would have been an advantage. But the small-scale sector was not in favor of this. And, you know, there are more votes in the small-scale sector than in the large-scale sector. So consciously, a decision was taken that, yeah, we need to liberalize this, but not immediately. So actually, the list of reserved sectors was pruned gradually. It took about 10 years before it got completely eliminated. So that's one, a compromise with vested interests. The second compromise with vested interests related to import liberalization. We freed up uh, imports of capital goods, imports of intermediates, components, et cetera, imports of raw materials. We did not free up imports of consumer goods because most of the Indian industry, the larger Indian industry was producing consumer goods. These guys were absolutely religiously in favor of liberalizing capital goods imports, liberalizing imports they needed for production, and were equally religiously opposed to liberalizing the outputs they produced. So one of the best, uh, one of the most, one of the strongest advocates for the liberalization of investment control over the private sector was Rahul Bajaj, the head of... Uh, the largest scooter manufacturing company in India, Bajaj Scooter. And he used, to, he used to really regale audiences, both in India and in Davos, that we're running a stupid policy and that you know I, I produce a product for which there's a 15-year waiting list, but the maximum output that I can produce is controlled by my license capacity. I mean, I can't produce more scooters because the government controls me and this should be got rid of and I should be allowed to freely expand. The same guy was totally opposed to allowing any import of scooters. I mean, and he famously said, you know, we must not confuse the national interest with the consumer interest. We made a sharp distinction between consumer interest and national interest. Anyway, we, we, we didn't succumb to that uh, temptation too much. Uh, and their view, by the way, was not that it shouldn't be done. But their view was you should do it more slowly, give us more time. And we often said to them that, listen, you've lived behind protective walls for 30 years. So how much more time do you need? Uh, but, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, Bajaj Scooters has done very well in the open world. I mean, it's not, it wasn't run by Rahul Bajaj, it was run by his son. And he actually modernized it. It did well in exports. It did very well and competed very effectively with the new scooters that came in. Of course, tariffs were still there on the high side. You know, my argument was, look, banning imports is really bad. It's better if you were to uh, uh, put in an import tariff because then you judge uh, how much of a preference uh, do uh, uh, are people willing to ex exert. And that was quite helpful. But these are two examples where the Indian reforms didn't take a look at what exists and say they're all wrong. And now let's redraft the whole thing. Started in a limited way, also uh, put in the stuff in a phased manner. Kind of a bit, this is, I think, what Deng Xiaoping had in mind. I mean, he's the world's greatest economic reformer, no question about it. You know, and he said, crossing the river while feeling the stones. And that's exactly uh, uh, what I think, in a way, uh, you could describe the Indian reforms as doing. Um, once that first set of reforms was done, then on the financial sector and various other things, we moved to more reforms. I won't go into all that. That's actually still a continuing story. But there were some, to my mind, rather obvious things uh, which I think we should have done more of. Uh, and one of them is privatizing the public sector. I mean, this is something that had been discussed internally. It's even there in my document. But the political resistance to that was really immense. And it's not just a political resistance uh, of the politicians. It's also a political resistance of the people who work in the public sector. And in a funny kind of way, uh, the, the strongest advocates for the continuation of the public sector are the professionals who work in the public sector because they view the private sector as family dominated. 
whereas the view of the public sector is genuinely competitive. I mean, if you happen to have an engineering degree and you've got into a public sector company, the chance of your becoming CMD, as these things are always probabilistic, but the chance may be X. If you did the same kind of guy in a private sector would deem his chance of becoming CMD zero. I mean, he would assume he could rise, but only up to a level. Whereas in the public sector, they'd go all the way up to the top. So a lot of the technical people, uh, and ultimately, I mean, uh, the value of a system depends on the quality of technical people. They were suspicious of the private sector. And to a large extent, that's because a family dominated, non-competitive private sector is not going to be motivated to give opportunities to the very best. It's only after they become kind of forced to compete that they start looking for who's the best person to manage. And that transition hasn't actually happened even today in India. Uh, but I think today it's true that while uh, the very few private sector firms have had the founders walk out of management, uh, they still hang on to management, but they don't put their cousins and their second cousins into all kinds of medium positions. So there's a big change from what the situation was in, let's say, 1980. Now, you know, these are attitudinal changes and uh, they, they have to be the foundation of reforms, but it takes a very long time to get this done. In the sense that if somebody is 55 and running a company, you know, he's not going to change. I'm, I'm firmly convinced that when I lecture, that's why I prefer lecturing to younger people. And I say this, that it's quite useless in India lecturing to anyone above the age of 50. I'm 79, by the way, so I'm kind of pitching the thing much below. Because I just, after 50, people don't change their mind. I mean, if you say something you like, there's a oh, great lecture, wonderful, I couldn't agree with you more. If you say something they don't like, that's a bit confused, hasn't got a full perspective, etc. It's only the younger people who are willing to say, I hadn't thought about that, maybe there's something here, right? So look at it that way, that it, if you do a bunch of reforms and at the top and the one below the top, you have a whole bunch of 55 year old people, they are extremely unlikely to do things differently or accept different ways of doing things. So you've got to keep in mind that you have to keep there plugging away at it until this lot move away and younger people move to the top. I should say that there are exceptions. I mean. Possibly the most successful software company in India is Infosys. And it was founded by Narayan Murthy and a few other people. And these guys actually walked out of the management. I mean, they still have whatever shares they have, but it's not being managed by either Narayan Murthy or, I mean, Nandan is the chairman, non-executive chairman of the board, but the CEO is not a family relative or whatever. I don't think any of our other major companies have quite got to that stage yet. Uh, so I expect that to happen in the next 20 years. But that gives you an idea that when you change a system, uh, the software part of that system takes a lot of time to change. So having said that, in summary, I think there's general agreement that India did well after the 91 reform. And certainly the growth rates went up and I won't go into all that detail. Uh, and um, there's a lot of debate. You know, sometimes people try to make comparisons between uh, the, this government and the other government and that government and the BJP government. That has a certain uh, value to my mind. But if you take a longer view, uh, my view would be that um, although we are running a very polarized system politically, and if you look at some of the political statements that are made in India, uh, you would get the impression, and in fact, some of them actually say that you know nothing good happened for 70 years, and then our government took over in 2014. But realistically, people, I mean, even this lot recognized that 1991 was a major break, and they don't mind conceding that. I think there's a lot more continuity. But you know, the continuity is of the kind which says we're going to change, but we're going to do it slowly and not one where you make a change dramatically. So virtually in every dimension, uh, that continuity is evident. It's reflected in an improved growth rate, but not a stellar one. I mean, 
India has never grown at the kind of rates that China did or South Korea did, okay? Uh, but it's grown at a rate that is quite respectable over a over a 10 year period. I, I mean, when I last did the calculation uh, for the for the government that I was there as deputy chairman for 10 years, 2004, 2014, growth slowed down in the later period. But the average of that whole period is 7.7, .7, which is pretty good. If you look at the present government, the average is nowhere near that good, but then they had the pandemic. So it's not fair to add that in. So you have to look at how did they perform in the pre-pandemic period? Well, 6.7. It's not as good as the previous 10 years. Uh, but I mean, the, the narrative here in defense of the government would be that the world economy didn't do that well. So the 7.7 .7 was buoyed upon a much more buoyant world economy. The 6.7 was post-global financial crisis, uh, all kinds of problems. And now you've got the pandemic and you've got the Ukraine war and you've got geopolitical fragmentation and no one, no one knows what the hell is gonna happen in the world economy. So it's very difficult. But there's a lot of discussion, you know, how, what is India capable of? You know, there seems to be a general consensus that the likely growth of India, growth rate that is, will exceed the growth rate of other emerging market countries, including China. I mean, China is, of course, five times as rich as India is now. But they've now reached the point where, you know, they're going to tail off in growth and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so for the first time in, in India, everybody is delighted that, you know, we're going to be the fastest growing country. Uh, I think there's a tendency to exaggerate uh, the growth possibility because we're looking at what was a good recovery. I mean, India was hit badly by the lockdown and the pandemic. But on the positive side, it recovered quite well, okay? It's a great mistake, of course, to think that because we recovered quite well, we're gonna keep growing at this rate. So we need to factor out the pandemic and look at what's the underlying growth rate. There are some, again, that's a good thing for your PhD guys to do, and there are many different ways of doing it, but very roughly, many people feel that uh, the underlying growth rate of the economy before the pandemic had slowed down probably to five and a half percent. That post pandemic, it could go a little better than five and a half percent depending on what policies are. But against that, the ambitions that have been set up today are much greater. And people are talking about, you know, we'll be so many trillion dollar economy by this year and so many trillion dollar developed economy by 2047, whatever. Now, these things are very difficult to convert into growth targets, and I think they should be converted because, you know, if you say I'm going to reach this level in 2047, but to say nothing about the trajectory, then theoretically, it's always possible to say, if you're not satisfied, you know, wait until 2047, it's going to happen. But if you convert it into a growth trajectory, it's reasonable to say, well, look, uh, that thing required an average of 8% or something, somewhere between 8 and 9 uh, and you're only growing at six and a half. And six and a half is quite good, but it's not going to get you to where you want. That debate needs to happen, and I'm sure it will happen. But my own guess is that uh, if the Indian political situation can reach a stable equilibrium with a 6% growth rate, the probability is that we can do it with a little bit more effort. Still require a little bit more effort, but can do it. If on the other hand, the political equilibrium requires an 8% growth, that requires a huge increase in the effort uh, in terms of reforms. And the question that I posed earlier, that you have to avoid the mistake of making a list of 100 reforms, because I'm sure that there are 100 things that need to be improved. The real question then is given where we've got two, uh, what are the most important four or five for the next 10 years and work at them? And that is, uh, I mean, I, I assume the government's thinkers, et cetera, are working on it. But if you ask me, what are the positives? I think the positives are that we have a pretty diversified private sector now, which has demonstrated its ability to function in, a, in the world that exists and even to carve out a reasonable export presence, particularly in services not in manufacturing yet. So that's a positive. 
I mean, there's lots of people. So uh, labor is not going to be a constraint, but the quality uh, and the, the skills that are embedded in labor, this is a major constraint. It isn't a constraint if you're going to grow at 5% because we're producing enough people to support 5% growth. We're not producing enough people to support faster than that. And that's a huge, uh, huge task before the government and the private sector. Uh, I think one of the positive things that's happening is, you know, infrastructure for the last 20 years, every government has emphasized it. This government is also emphasizing it and they're doing something. I mean, I think on infrastructure, there's a fair amount of progress. Anybody who flies into India, we'll see that the airports look different, et cetera, et cetera, if you haven't been for 20 years. So that, that change is there. But I think another dimension in which there is change uh, and which is more modern is in the whole digitalization process. Now that, uh, you know, is, uh, that's one area, when I mean digitalization, I don't just mean lots of people with smartphones watching Netflix on it. I mean, that's not bad, uh, but it, it's, doesn't do much for productivity. But the truth of the matter is they're also networked, they can make payments. Uh, if they're using it to make payments, then uh, FinTechs can use that information to make an assessment of their credit worthiness. FinTechs are coming up and partnering with banks uh, and saying, look, if you will allow us access to the data of these people, or these people themselves will allow access to their data, which they have to, then we can do a lot of analysis and tell you whether a particular person is worth lending to. Now, in a world in which uh, people migrate and the South is growing faster than the North, so a lot of the more dynamic people move from the North, go to the South. I mean, it's very difficult for a regular bank to do a traditional type of credit analysis of such a person. But with digitalization, if he's using the uh, payments, modern payment system, is a lot easier. And lots of people tell me that that is happening. Uh, many, many modestly placed people are able to get modest sums of money uh, from the banks. And earlier, the extent of exclusion was very sharp. I mean, banks loved lending money to people who had assets. So if you were asset heavy, you could become even more asset heavy. But if you had a lot of skills and you need a little bit of assets, you just couldn't get a bank loan. Uh, and that they say is likely to change. I believe it is likely to change. And that's an important factor. You know, one critical thing that uh, uh, looking long-term, I mean, India is going to be very badly affected by the climate change, which is underway. And I think we have a problem in the sense that uh, if you ask somebody, shouldn't we do something to manage climate change? They all say, yes, of course, we must. But you have to tell them that, look, there's nothing you can do as a country which is sufficient to manage climate change. The whole world has to do it. That means we have to be part of some international uh, consensus on what countries should do. And the good news is that uh, during the COP26 discussions two years ago, for the first time, all developing countries agreed to get to a particular net zero at a particular time. Now, you know, this, this, this end date approach is not, in my view, the right way of determining what is a just transition, because you can get to net zero following this kind of trajectory or this kind of trajectory. And the carbon burden that you impose in the first is hugely greater than in the latter. But they haven't, they, they have agreed to 2030 <clears throat> and 2070. And India's subscribed uh, to that. So this is going to be a big challenge that can India start undertaking the energy transition that is required to achieve the targets we have ourselves set. Now the bad news is that if everybody achieves the target, can I have a glass of water? If everybody achieves the targets they've set, we still won't be achieve the climate goal. So that has to be left to the negotiating process for everybody to do more. And I think Climate Tracker tracks every country. And in, in that tracking, thank you, uh, they deem the US to be insufficient. 
in other words, the U.S. is not doing enough to achieve its own goals. Almost nobody is sufficient. India is highly in insufficient. Uh, and many countries are completely off track. Uh, so in that environment, you can get stuck in that and say, look, we must have negotiations and we will. But limited objective, to carry credibility, we should be deemed to be sufficient for the targets we've ourselves set, knowing that if we want to save the world, these targets will have to be tightened. Definitely not relaxed, but tightened. And I think that's a huge challenge because what it means really, energy accounts for 50% of the, I mean, the, the power sector, the generation of electricity accounts for 50% of the uh, CO2 emissions in India. A sensible strategy will involve, uh, first of all, a lot more electrification so people like uh, transport, et cetera, that's relying on fossil, uh, liquid fossil fuels has to electrify. So the electricity demand will expand and the electricity has to move away from coal to renewable. So you're causing a structural change within electricity in a framework where the role of electricity will increase. And that raises the question of how you're gonna do it, how you're gonna bear the costs, even if the costs are bearable, how are you going to finance the extra capital expenditure? Because uh, the, the renewable energy is going to be more capital intensive upfront with a lot of saving in the recurring costs. There are some benefits because we won't be importing uh, petroleum products. So on the balance of payments, a huge benefit, but over a 30, 40 year period. But how to get this transition going uh, that is uh, the big challenge. Now, you know, the good news is that if you ask yourself, is anything happening? Or are the Indians just talking and doing nothing? This, the answer is no, things are happening. I mean, the, the, the growth of uh, renewable capacity in India is amongst the fastest in the world. Of course, it's from the, one of the lowest bases. But the amounts are not trivial in the sense that from six gigawatts in 2005 or so, it's now about 120 gigawatts. That's a very big increase in terms of gigawattage of renewable solar and wind capacity. But our target was 175 gigawatts. So while it's great that we, we're not stagnating at five, uh, we got up to 122, but we fell short of what we needed by about 50 gigawatts. So these are long-term trends and these messages hopefully will get uh, internalized and somebody will have to do something about it. Uh, say, the same thing will happen on uh, um, uh, electrification of uh, transport. At the moment, about 2 or 3% of two-wheeler and three-wheeler vehicles are electric, which is minuscule. I mean, China is about 15 or something of that order. So we need to set higher targets. But, you know, these targets have to be pushed by statutory enforcement. I mean... The EU has said that uh, no internal combustion engine vehicle will be sold after 2035. And now working backwards, if we want to be net zero by 2070, we should certainly expect the entire transport fleet, not the new sales, the fleet, to be electrified by, let's say, 2050. And if the average life of a vehicle is something of the order of 15 years in, the, in India, that really means somewhere around 2035, 2040, you should say no more electric vehicles to be sold. Now that, in one sense, it's a 17 year transition period. But you know, the transition is not a trivial transition because basically uh, electric vehicles produce, require very few components compared to the internal combustion engine. And a lot of our industry is geared to providing automotive components. But these guys have to be persuaded that they must either disappear and do something else or change their production pattern or somehow or the other get into, I mean, either producing or servicing batteries or all the new things that will have to happen if that transition has to occur. You know, the Indian corporate sector is giving out signals like we're going to move to green hydrogen and this and that. 
But that's that's also a very cost based factor because uh, I am told that uh, if you want to absorb the higher cost of green hydrogen uh, on uh, the user industry, it needs compared with what they're using at the moment, you need to reduce the cost of production to about a dollar per kg from something like five dollars at present. So you know this is another area where. Yeah, it's not just India that has to do it. The whole world has to do it. So uh, we've seen in the case of solar panels, uh, massive reductions in cost. Will we have the same thing in, uh, uh, in green hydrogen? Similarly, the question of the efficiency of electrolyzers. I mean, these are new areas of research where everybody in the world will be looking at. I mean, either that or the world's going to burn. So, I mean, uh, because, you know, at the moment, heavy trucks and all these kind of stuff, uh, there are no simple ways of taking care of that problem. India doesn't have to lead in this. We just have to watch what's happening and be able to absorb the relevant technology. But in certain areas, we might want to actually produce the stuff that's relevant. I mean, certainly producing solar panels, if you're going to have, a, we may end up with, uh, uh, some people think that by 2050, uh, we may end up wanting, needing a, a, a renewable energy capacity, which goes up to about 7,000 gigawatts capacity. Now, if you have that scale, then it makes sense to have a capacity to produce uh, panels and even cells and modules and what have you. So how to orchestrate a policy that does that without insulating the country from the rest of the world? I mean, the worst thing would be that we simply say that we will only allow Indian modules irrespective of cost and ban all imports. There are people, by the way, who might be tempted to do that. But you know, is that what you really want? That basically means that you're burdening the user with the additional costs. If it turns out that other people are producing this stuff much cheaper, you'll ask yourself, why are you denying yourself that offer? So these are questions that I don't think they've actually been addressed. They need to be addressed. Failure to make the right decision will repeat what we did in the 1970s. I think we're too smart to make that sort of mistake. But I don't think the danger is adequately realized yet and hasn't been spoken about yet. I mean, to some extent, I'm afraid the rise of protectionism in the United States is serving as an intellectual stimulus to these kinds of ideas. Because, you know, people say, look, we've heard you guys talking about the open economy and so on. But anyway, uh, in the universities that used to spew these ideas, they've changed their mind. And they're all now supporting uh, protectionism. Uh, you know, the, the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, I mean, many people say <clears throat> is a wonderful example of creative nomenclature. Because instead of calling it the protection in order to become self-sufficient act, which hundreds of people who've done PhDs on the cost of protection and the mistaken idea of self-sufficiency would object to. You call it the Inflation Reduction Act. So who's in favor of reducing inflation? Everybody will put their hands on. Ergo, please go out and vote for this bill. Everybody will go and vote for the bill. So we'll be doing something similar. So I think this is a real issue that, uh, I don't think it's been adequately discussed. It's not, in my view, to be honest, it's not adequately discussed in the United States. Uh, and uh, it's certainly not adequately discussed in India, but I think academic communities ought to, ought to think about that. And I think this is linked to the kind of world that we are moving into, because you know, if, if the world is actually getting fragmented, if the United States is not going to be, I mean, one thing is the United States doesn't want to be very open with China because China has, after all, declared national policies to challenge the US militarily and economically and technologically. So if you say that kind of thing, you expect the other country to say, hang on a minute, I'm not sure I agree with you. But you know, if you're gonna fragment between the US and Europe, then I mean, it's a very peculiar world that we are moving into. Uh, I mean, right now we are about to have a G20 meeting. You know, I had the privilege of being uh, the Indian Sherpa on the first G20 summit that was held in Washington, D.C., 2008. And that was really a moment of uh, 
if you like, uh, substantive multilateralism because decisions on what to do in the aftermath of the Lehman crisis would normally have been taken in the G7. And I think it was a recognition that the G7 isn't the whole economy. You've got to get these other guys involved because they're an important part. And they set up the G20. And the G20 was explicitly set up to be the principal uh, forum for the resolution of international economic problems. Now it's going to meet in September under the chairmanship of India. And the G20 consists of the G7, the G2, which is Russia and China, four or five other countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, et cetera, which are kind of working out how the hell do we handle this? And there are a few small countries that really are looking at everyone else. But, you know, in a world in which the world simply doesn't have a common view on how to resolve, let's say, the Russian-Ukraine problem, uh, how much we expect uh, out of these four on other issues becomes an open question. So those are that's the world that India has to negotiate in. And I think we need to think a lot more about it. And I'm sure we will. Thank you so much for attending. Uh, Montek will be here and you can pick up a copy of the book to, you know, understand more about the journey. He'll be around to answer some questions, but I think we'll officially call an end to the lecture because I know many of you have meetings. Thank you so much, Montek, for doing this. This was a pleasure.